I'm going to consider equations uh, in the most general case of this form, where the right hand side is in the most general case a measure. So you have to pay attention to the definition of the solutions because uh, solutions should be, um, I mean, considered in a suitable way, but let's think just of a priori estimates because once you get the right a priori estimates, then you can build uh, approximation schemes in order to get these a priori estimates for more general, for more regular uh, data and solutions, uh, uh, then you can make them work to more general settings. So actually the main, uh, the main things I'm going to, uh, to wonder is whether or not the gradient is bounded, but in more general cases, I want to know the best possible results I can assert on the solution starting from the most general things uh, uh, assumptions I can put on the, on the measure mu on the da on the data. Um, so um, uh, so the idea of the talk is to show of the first part of the talk is that uh, um, a whole range of estimates that are actually working in the linear case uh, have a counterpart in the nonlinear one. So therefore, I will start considering the uh, elliptic non-degenerate case because here the main point is really passing uh, from linear to non-linear and then eventually I'm going to consider the generate operators like these two. And then in the last part I'm going to talk about new results and these are for non-uniformly elliptic operators as well. So when p is different than 2 I'm going to consider these classical assumptions by Lagishka and Duhalseva, and they are actually saying that uh, you can bound from below the lowest eigenvalue by something that grows like uh, uh, z squared, let's say the gradient to the p minus two, and and um, from the above to the gradient p minus two, once again. And therefore, the operator is still uniformly elliptic because the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue remains bounded away from zero and plus infinity. So when mu is equal to zero, we fully fall in the realm of the classical, the George Nash Moser theory. Uh, okay, uh, in the, so in the, so what you usually do when it, there's a Laplacian here, you bound the gradient and you via convolution with the fundamental solution. And therefore you use risk potentials. Uh, in the nonlinear case, you do not want to use risk potentials always, and um, there's a large tradition of people using the so-called having Mazia-Wolf potentials. And, and these are what? This is the usual risk potential, the risk potential operator, incorporating the deficit scaling of the equation. So the risk potential is the convolution uh, of uh, the operator, the, the risk potential operator is the classical convolution in one over x minus y to the n minus beta. And this n minus beta uh, uh, plays the role of this role. When, uh, when p is different than 2, you then you want, want to use, the tradition is to use the having mazia wolf potentials. So um, these nonlinear potentials were introduced in this very famous legendary paper of uh, Mazia and Adin. Okay, the first general result is due to Kirpelang and Mali, and they were able to show that for this equation, as well as for any other nonlinear equation, you can pointwise bound u by the Wolf potential, plus the usual uh, localization term that eventually goes to zero and capital I goes to plus infinity. So when uh, p is equal to two, this is the usual pointwise estimate by u via the risk potential, because the Wolf, the having Mazia Wolf potential, coincides with, uh, with the Wolf potential when P is equal to two. So the real strength of this story is that you can pointwise bound by U by, the, by this nonlinear potential, which is actually a linear potential when P is equal to two. Therefore, this result is, all, is already non-trivial when P is equal to two. And the proof actually makes no difference about difficulties when P is different than two or is equal to 2. So, um, and um, essentially when you are on the whole Rn, this is u less than or equal to the convolution with the fundamental solution. So this is a nonlinear convolution with a, with a ghost of a fundamental solution. So uh, there were, after this, two major open problems in the linear potential theory. First, you want to get a, a gradient analog 
of this estimate, and then you want to pass to the vectorial, <coughs> to the vectorial case. Okay, so the first, uh, the first answer to this uh, problem has been given by, by me when p is equal to two, so you get any quasi-linear equation, and you can point twice bound du via the usual risk potential plus this localization term. So when you are when you are on the whole Rn and either the solution is in W11 or it has a good decay at infinity for its for instance it decays as the, the usual Green's function, then you can point twice bound the gradient by the risk potential. <coughs> <coughs> So this is not COVID, do not worry. Um, so what's the point here is that once you get this estimate, you can just forget about this equation and you can get for free a priori gradient estimates just looking at the action of the risk potential on the data. So in a, in a way you are fully linearizing a theory because you don't have to do estimates anymore considering in which function space the data are but you just make a convolution with the fundamental solution. And then since the, the, the action of the risk potential on say any reasonable rearrangement invariant function space is known, therefore you can get immediately gradient estimates. So what happens when P is different than two? So when P is different than two, um, then the orthodoxy of this nonlinear potential theory prescribes you want to use having Maziawu potentials. This, they usually replace risk potentials whenever you have P different than two or a nonlinear problem for P different than two. And, uh, and uh, if you anyway make this brave heuristic argument, uh, then you discover and you actually conjecture something different because consider this modal equation and then you just you formally rewrite this equation in these two pieces so uh, just concentrate on the first on the first equation this is a non elliptic equation because once you get a solution you get infinitely many solutions because you add any curl and any curl can be anything because divergence kills the curl but actually how do you prove that there exists a solution to this equation? This actually goes back to the 70s, it's something called uh, Bogolsky's lemma in the fluid dynamics. But uh, essentially what you do, you apply the I1 risk potential to both sides, and then I1 is nothing but an integration. So an integration cancels a divergence, and then you get that V is less than or equal than I1. This is essentially what you do when you prove Bogolsky's lemma being careful at the bound. Now, if you assume that for just uh, for an odd strange case, B is essentially equal to this, to the guy you want to deal with, then the equation is telling you that actually you would uh, bound point Y as the gradient by the risk potential, exactly as it were, once again, a linear problem. Surprisingly enough, this estimate is true and uh, what you get is the following pointwise estimate for the P-Laplacian equation and actually for any other equation obeying the, 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 the ellipticity and growth assumptions I showed you in the first slide. So in other words, nothing changes when you uh, pass from the Poisson equation to any other equation. You just have to add the, the right scaling exponent. This result has a certain story because uh, um, for p equals to 2, it coincides with, with the first result I got. Um, uh, the first result in this direction for p larger than 2 was by Dutza and myself, where again, having Mazia Wolf potentials were used. And then for p larger or equal than 2 minus 1 over n with this estimate. And then with the Tuomokuus, we were finally able to prove this for any p larger than 2. Then there are recent results on the remaining range due to Ngu Yang and Hook. Okay, um, so what's the outcome? The outcome of this estimate is actually that you can linearize the whole theory. You can make it linear in one shot. Just so let me give you some examples of corollaries of very well-known results that now follow as corollaries because you know 
what's the action of the risk potential on any data. For this model equation, uh, for instance, uh, if you consider higher integrability results for the gradient, then these mm, famous results of Ivanitz and Di Benedetto Manfredi, they follow as a corollary. Uh, and then the classical theory for measure data problems of Bocardo and Galloway, it follows again with local estimates. Also the classical estimates of Talenti, they follow again, those ones, the rearrangements, plus, plus additional borderline cases that were not able to, to be proved in borderline cases. Okay, let, just let me give you an equivalent reformulation of this, uh, of this, uh, of this story. Uh, since A is elliptic, it uh, by coercivity controls again due to the P minus one, and then you can rewrite this statement in a purely intrinsic way. If you look at the, at the shape of this a priori estimate, and you usually concentrate on the first part, because by letting capital R goes to go to plus infinity, then this term disappears on the whole Rn, then you see that the exponent P has disappeared. So this rewriting reveals the full intrinsic linearizing nature of this estimate. So you can pointwise bound the A of the U by U. So whenever you have something under the sign of divergence, then you can formally apply I1 to both sides and get uh, this intrinsic estimate. This holds under P growth conditions, but it's actually a general phenomenon because um, this is a non-trivial paper of Baroni from uh, a few years ago that tells you that whenever you have a non-necessarily polynomial type operator, but which is nevertheless uniformly elliptic, then you can once again bound what you have under the sign of divergence with the risk potential. So it's a general phenomenon, in other words. So this uh, fully solves in actually a, in an unexpected way the original problem of, uh, of uh, that stemmed after, after these original papers of, uh, of this Finnish school uh, in the 80s and in the 90s. Okay. Now, uh, so what are we doing here? Here we are doing something which is replacing the, the missing fundamental solution formula because the problem is not linear. Actually, fundamental solutions, uh, they are connected to fractional integrals. But when you want to, to go to, to um, maximal differentiability, then a singular integrals come into the play. So let me give something about uh, a connection of this estimate with uh, the ghost of singular integrals. So this estimate is a ghost of a fractional integral. So now we deal with the ghost of um, um, singular integrals. Okay, these spaces are very popular nowadays. I'm not even sure if I should recall this definition. So you know that B belongs to WS gamma, provided S is in this range and gamma is larger or equal than one. If the oscillations, the growth of the oscillation is in L gamma are small enough to compensate the blow up of this kernel. So all in all this quantity, which is called Gallardo norm, uh, scales and behaves in, from the scaling viewpoint from uh, an S derivative to the gamma. These bases are coming uh, along with, uh, with their own embedding. So this is how maximal differentiability controls maximal integrability in elliptic problems too. So, uh, so if you go to the previous estimates, the previous estimates assert the maximal integrability of the gradient. For instance, a very easy, uh, the corollary of the previous estimates, as well as a very classical result, first proved by Bocardo, Vasquez, uh, Galloway, and Pierre, uh, Gariepi, and other people, is that uh, the gradient uh, of any solution actually belongs to this Marcinkiewicz space. That's the weak ln over n minus one space, Lebic space. Um, that's the best possible one as suggested by the fundamental, the, the usual Green's function for the Poisson equation. Okay, anyway, no, nothing is known on the differentiability of the gradient. So a very old result of mine fixes this gap 
proving that actually, if you cannot be in W11, so if the gradient cannot be in W11, because of the, of the, um, uh, of the missing uh, endpoint case of calderon Zygmunt theory thing, for instance, of Poisson equation with L1 data, then you are still in W sigma one for every sigma less than one. So you are in every fractional space before the forbidden one. And uh, the proof is very, very delicate because it uses a sort of uh, nonlinear analog of um, little petty decompositions, which actually connects the elliptic theory with atomic decompositions in, fractal, in fractional solvable spaces. And this comes along with the usual catch up polytype inequality where you bound high order derivatives by, um, by lower order ones, as here. Okay, what happens when P is different than two? So the idea is that when P is different than two, because this estimate was obtained for P equals to two and for any nonlinear equation, actually in this paper, there was also an estimate for P different than two, but it was for the gradient uh, and it was not intrinsic. Now for P larger than two, and for P actually also larger than two minus one over N, then you can prove uh, uh, the following singular integral analog of the previous result. So, once again, under the sign of divergence, what you find under the sign of divergence belongs to W sigma one for every sigma less than one. And this is exactly the same phenomenon that you get for the Poisson equation. In other words, in the, in the classical calderon zygmunt theory, when the right-hand side belongs to L1, you trade the divergence with, the, uh, with an additional gradient, uh, and then you miss the end point, but then you get all the fractional spaces before. So it's a general phenomenon. And once again, this comes along with a purely intrinsic estimate, because you see that in the shape of this estimate, the exponent P is not appearing, is not appearing anymore. So this is, let's say the calderon Zygmunt analog of the previous estimate, the, the singular integral analog of the previous estimate. So if we want to connect, uh, if we want to connect the two previous estimates in one shot, we have that uh, for any quasi-linear equation of this type, then you pointwise bound what is under the sign of divergence with the risk potential, that's, that is with a fractional integral. And, uh, and this is a ghost of the fractional integral. And then you can point, and then you can, I mean, locally bound the, the fractional derivatives of what you have under the sign of divergence for any sigma less than one, therefore for every exponent before the forbidden one. So this uh, gives a complete picture of the dislinearization program for the for gradient estimates that we have been pursuing uh, for many years by now. So it gives a complete theory in these two estimates. Um, and then for n equal to two, there is this nice paper by Balci, Dining, and Weimer um, that tells that you can actually pick the whole range of Biesel spaces because you know that uh, these fractional solvable spaces are just one way to say that a certain fa function is differentiable in a fractional sense. Other ways are prescribed by, let's say, so-called Sobolev Slobodesky spaces, which are these ones, and Nikolsky spaces, and they are actually uh, special instances of a more general family called BS of spaces, which involves three parameters, actually. There are, there are also something which is called Calderon spaces, but I'm not going to go into this here. Okay, uh, in the vectorial case, the the problem has remained unsolved for many years, and then we finally, with Tuomo, we were able to crack it down, and uh, we were able to prove both the original Kirchberg and Emily estimate and the risk potential estimate for the Pilaplacian system. Let me point out that it is very crucial here that you have this specific system, or a quasi or a so-called quasi-diagonal system, because otherwise, this result cannot be true for any uh, elliptic system cannot be true for any elliptic system. Because otherwise, because otherwise singularities uh, do uh, occur. And uh, also there's a result by Tom and myself, a previous result for the, for a special right inside. And once again, 
then you can get uh, you can get uh, essentially one shot as corollaries results of um, remarkable results of several people and actually you can extending one shot uh, certain theories to the vectorial case uh, for instance uh, the the main points uh, are about recovered the classical theories for scalar measure data problems can be upgraded to the vectorial case also and this this theory was missing because it was only scalar also classical talentis estimates the rearrangements were confined to the scalar case and now they can be upgraded to the vectorial case plus then you can put uh, many borderline cases that were unknown um, the proof of this result is, um, I would say, rather non-trivial because uh, it is based on a very delicate bridge uh, between um, nonlinear potential theory and um, uh, so-called uh, partial regularity theory and epsilon regularity theorems that find their origins in the work of uh, the judging. In fact, we are able to prove uh, um, a measure problems tailored version of the famous Lipschitz approximation or harmonic approximation lemma of the judge uh, in the nonlinear measure data case. And uh, this is pr probably a tool that is going to be, uh, to be useful in many other places. Um, additional papers I'd like to, to to recall at this time, there's this paper by Bright, Chanky, Dean, Incusi, and Schwarzacher, um, and it analyzes systems in the, with right hand side in divergence forms, or you are in the range of energy solutions. Then there's a nice paper by Chanky and Mazia where they give a global, uh, in the scalar case, a global rearrangement version of the risk potential estimate. So they consider a global problem with boundary data. Uh, with zero boundary data, and then they prove that uh, you can point, you can not point twice, but globally bound the rearrangement of the gradient via the rearrangement of the risk potential. So it's a sort of mixture in rearrangements. Um, and then there's there's also uh, uh, I mean this interesting paper uh, where there is uh, this linearization in the range of PMO estimates. Now, up to now, we have seen that potentials control um, the size of solutions, both of U and the gradient. Uh, let me show you briefly how they can be used to control oscillations and therefore continuity of, uh, of solutions, just a, a small glimpse. Uh, okay, a trivial, a trivial corollary of the, of the risk potential estimate is the following one. You get me this equation, you want to know when the gradient is bounded and then it is sufficient exactly as in the Poisson case that the risk potential is bounded. This provides uh, actually an answer to an old conjecture that was told me that it goes back to Nino Realceva who conjectured that the conditions on data ensuring that the gradient is locally bounded are actually independent of P and this condition is P independent. This condition is P independent. Okay, now uh, there are also previous papers in special cases on this. Uh, now, uh, in the same paper with Tuomo, we introduced uh, actually the following continuity criterion for the gradient. Then now we do not assume that this quantity is only bounded, but we also assume that it goes to zero uniformly with respect to x. Now observe that if you assume that this quantity is bounded, then by absolute continuity of the integral, then it goes to zero pointwise. Now you want to reinforce this by assuming that this goes to zero uniformly. And then what you can come up is that the gradient is continuous. Uh, this is intuitively clear because in these kinds of problems, singularities occur at any time, um, the measure concentrates on certain small dimensional sets. So if you exclude such a concentration, for instance, on sets that are whose house of dimension is smaller than n minus one, 
and then you even prescribe that there is this uh, small concentration criterion, then the gradient turns out to be continuous. A funny corollary is the following. Uh, it relates to the, to the, um, uh, the so-called Stein theorem. So Stein's theorem, um, it's, um, uh, so St what is Stein's theorem? It's actually a sort of borderline case of Sobolev embed, Sobolev Murray embedding theorem. Um, so you want to know what is the, the slightest condition, the slightest integrability condition on the gradient you want to impose to get that D is continuous. And this turns out to be the Lorentz space LM1. This Lorentz space is prescribed by the decay of these level sets. So LM1 is the space of functions whose level sets are decaying fast enough in order to to make this uh, integral finite. They are uh, actually uh, natural spaces because uh, um, the second index that turns the first one in this sense usually prescribes things that grow like locks. So this is the next natural things, the next natural thing after powers. Um, so, um, an equivalent reformulation of, um, of, um, of Stein's theorem is, um, is the following one. You want to know, you want to know, um, uh, when, uh, solutions to this bounded, uh, solution to this, uh, this system are bounded, and then uh, you prescribe that the right hand side is in LN1. Because they are interpolation spaces, Lorentz spaces are interpolation spaces as well. They, and then uh, prescribing that uh, Laplacian belongs to LN1 tells that uh, by Calderon Sigmund theory that the second derivatives are in LN1, but then by Stein's theorem, the gradient is continuous. So this is a, an equivalent formulation of, uh, of Stein's theorem. Okay, and then we have the following surprises nonlinear Stein theorem. Once again, if you have that the right hand side belongs to LN1, then the gradient is continuous. So once again, there is no difference between the linear and the nonlinear case, and um, this criterion is totally p independent. Totally p independent. So how the proof goes on, the proof is very simple. It takes less than half a page, actually a few lines, to check that if a measure or if a function belongs to this space, then this criterion is satisfied. This criterion is satisfied. And then you assume, you, you, you deduce that the gradient is continuous. So this is actually another way how this kind of approach, which is a fully linearizing approach, is reducing the, the whole nonlinear theory to the linear case. And actually you can even go further, actually you can do, you can do the same arguments in the setting of fully nonlinear equations. And then you know uh, that, uh, that you can prove the same things for, for fully nonlinear equations. And then you get uh, certain endpoint cases of Caffarelli and Tubinger's uh, gradient theories. Actually, dealing with fully nonlinear equations in this setting, uh, um, uh, it's, um, uh, um, it requires the use of these Caffarelli's Pucci's operator and Tubinger's approach too. And also, in, in connection to this, there are some recent uh, very interesting papers by Teixeira that also are related to these kinds of corollaries that you can find in this paper too. Okay, these are gradient estimates as long as, uh, as uh, uniformly elliptic problems are considered. Because the, ray, the range here is, uh, it only, it's only about uniformly elliptic problems. Now I would like to, to um, uh, to tell something about uh, um, to tell something about uh, 
um, non-uniformly elliptic problems. Okay, in the non-uniformly elliptic setting, I'm going to consider um, functionals of this type. And therefore, the Euler Lagrange equation or the, the system is uh, of the type we have been previously, previously considering. Now, if you observe the previous growth conditions, or if you just think to the P Laplacian operator, you will see that the ratio between the highest eigenvalue and the lowest eigenvalue of this matrix is bounded. Uniformly elliptic, uniform, uh, uniformly elliptic problems, uh, they use that this ratio is bounded. When you switch to non-uniformly elliptic problems, then you go to plus infinity. And this, uh, these problems are usually um, um, connected to functionals with no standard growth conditions. For instance, now you are considering uh, functionals with no necessarily polynomial growth conditions, like this and uh, like, uh, like this, which is non uniformly elliptic, which is close to be linear. You can consider. Um, you can consider certain energies of this type. Uh, that are continuously oscillating between these two powers. So you don't get a power type integrand. You don't get a power type integrand. And for certain ranges, these are non-uniformly elliptic. Then there's a recently interesting paper by De Filippis and Leonetti that connect these kinds of functionals with uniform ellipticity, finding certain special ranges of parameters. Um, another theorem is this, uh, Another possible structure is the one of an isotropic growth condition. So here you are penalizing every directional derivative with its own exponent. And then, and then you can get, uh, you can get, uh, you can get a new energy that once again has no, has no, um, um, has no polynomial growth from below and from above of the usual type. So there is no, not the same p that is working uh, that is working to bound uh, the, the energy density from below and from above and then you can go you can be very very wild because you can consider these kinds of functionals with, uh, and they have a, a very very fast growth conditions um, you can consider any composition of uh, exponential growth functionals these are three papers that first considered these problems, but then there are other contributions, for instance, in the KAM theory by Craig Evans and the recent uh, interesting result by Di Marco and Marcellini for non-autonomous functionals. Um, um, these functionals have uh, a double personality because in principle, it should be easier to get Lipschitz estimates for these functionals because you're penalizing higher and higher, uh, I mean, growth of the gradients, but actually they are very difficult to deal with because they, the energy density doesn't satisfy the so-called delta two condition. So uh, essentially, if um, a function has this kind of integrability, if you put uh, a number which is slightly larger than one, then you might lose this integrability condition. That's the failure of the delta two condition. So they become difficult to handle, difficult to handle. Okay. These are examples of non-uniformly elliptic integrands. Okay, they are connected to, for instance, uh, uh, in the polynomial growth range, but non-homogeneous, uh, then you immediately find uh, that uh, you have to put a bound on this ratio. A bound on this ratio is given, for instance, uh, prescribing that Q over P is not too far from one, otherwise, uh, there are counterexamples telling you that you're losing any kind of uh, regularity starting from, uh, from uh, the fact that solutions might be unbounded. There are uh, famous examples by Marcellini and Jacqui. And um, a model result I would like to show you now is, uh, is the following one by Marcellini. Uh, is the following one by Marcellini. So Marcellini originally considered uh, a functional with uh, polynomial growth conditions where the rate of non-uniform ellipticity is, uh, is provided as follows. The lowest eigenvalue grows like P minus two and the highest by Q minus two. Therefore the ratio 
goes to, to plus infinity with the gradient at the q minus p power. And uh, so if q minus p is too large, then this ratio becomes unbounded too fast, and then you lose, you might lose regularity. So this is the content of this uh, by now classical result of Marcellini that states exactly the following thing. So you can, uh, you provide a bound on this ratio that provides a bound on the, on the possible blow up of this ratio of this non-uniformly of this ellipticity ratio and then uh, you can prove that actually uh, the gradient is bounded. For these problems this is the kind of focus of um, ultimate regularity results you want to have because once you know that the gradient is bounded then growth conditions at infinity become irrelevant and then you can go back in several cases to the usual uniformly elliptic theories because there's no, I mean, there's no need now to consider the behavior of the ellipticity ratio when the gradient is goes to plus infinity because just the gradient is not going to plus infinity. And then you can, uh, over the years, of course, there have been uh, quite a lot of uh, results on how to improve this, uh, these kinds of things. There are these papers by um, Bell and Schaffner on analysis and PDEs. Then there's a previous paper on CPM on the same uh, result. There's a paper by Hirsch and Schaffner. There's a recent very interesting paper by De Filippis, Christensen and Koch, where they prove this by duality methods, by additional assumptions, then they eventually get better and better bounds. These results of Hirsch and Schaffner is optimal due to the counterexamples of Marcellini, so it's a significant result. Uh, Moreover, when there are also interpolative, um, I mean, there are interpolation phenomena. When you start from bounded minimizers, then you can relax the bound and the bound becomes uh, um, independent of the dimension. This was first, uh, first uh, uh, um, observed by Uyaltsev and Duetalekova. It's a famous paper, okay, now famous at the that time was not very famous because it was published on one of these uh, Russian journals that uh, they were not uh, not easily uh, accessible in the West. And uh, then there are other results by Jun Choi, by De Filippis, and myself. And um, and this tells that if you start from uh, more regular solutions, then you can relax the bounds. Um, um, uh, then there are also some recent parabolic papers by De Filippis, uh, and uh, where there is a full, I mean, uh, that uh, where the parabolic version of these problems is treated in full generality, actually. Uh, mm, and uh, uh, amongst these results that we have around, I would like to single on a recent result that I like very much by Busquen Brasco that tells you how uh, these kinds of problems are actually between different between each other because uh, there's a counterbalance. Uh, if, you, if you try to get a general PQ structure, then you might lose specific structure properties allowing you to get better results. This is a, a classical fact in the calculus of variations that uh, uh, when, you, when, you, when you make too ma much abstract nonsense and you lose certain specific phenomena, this is the case, for instance, of, uh, of harmonic mappings that were first treated as uh, solutions of systems with critical uh, growth conditions. Then this result tells you that if you take this functional, which is the anisotropic or non-orthotropic uh, de Laplacian, so you penalize each derivative and then you miss due to the P, you don't put it, so this is not completely uniformly elliptic in the usual sense, then there is no bound to get Lipschitz continuity once you know that uh, minimizers are bounded. So you need no bound, you simply need no bound. Okay, now let me, I want to, I want to go back on these non-autonomous functionals because uh, now uh, data are going to come back and uh, actually, I, want, I would like to talk about some recent results with Lisa Beck. And these results, they tell you that uh, actually this phenomenon that we have seen, 
that is the, the these conditions allowing for Lipschitz continuity of minimizers are p independent and are independent of any equations in the uniformly elliptic setting, they actually can be extended to the non-uniformly elliptic setting. And this is quite surprising because now we are catching several structures, several different structures. Um, okay, the, the assumptions I'm going to put here are the, the, these ones, then the, there's a balance, there's a, there's a lower bound on the smallest eigenvalue and the upper bound on the highest eigenvalue. And then, I control, I control the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue with a power type of this integrand, which in a sense uh, represents the, na it's the natural integrand to describe the coercivity of the, of the, of the, of the function. Uh, so this is a power type. I'm not going to specify this. Those who are interested, they can look at the paper. And then the result is very general. The result is very general and tells you that, um, that the Lorentz space, LN1, is still the relevant one in the non-uniformly elliptic setting. And this, whenever you want to, whenever is the functional you want to consider. Uh, this estimate looks a bit weird due to this integral. It is actually not because when you, particularize this G1 to various examples, then you get a, a pretty natural, a pretty natural growth condition on the gradient. So this result tells you that this, the, the role played by LN1 is a universal role, independently of the fact that you are getting a uniformly or a non-uniformly elliptic operator. So how did we get this? Uh, by using essentially a new approach in this theory. It's a nonlinear potential theoretic approach, uh, which is used in this setting for the first time. And uh, this approach actually allows to reduce the treatment of non-uniformly elliptic operators uh, to the treatment of uniformly elliptic ones. So we, in some sense, we once, uh, okay, before we were, um, I mean, reducing the nonlinear theory to the linear one at the level of estimates, and here we reduce the uh, non-uniformly elliptic operators to the uniformly elliptic one, uh, uh, to, the uh, to the uniformly elliptic ones, and then we go, we reduce in turn these to linear problems. Um, and uh, there are new estimates actually for f equal to zero two. Um, this is what I was talking about. And uh, this theorem essentially covers most of the general examples that you find in the literature. Um, then we also have new results in the uniformly elliptic setting because we are able to treat it more efficiently. Actually, we make this reduction from non-uniformly elliptic to uniformly elliptic ones, and then from uniformly elliptic ones to linear ones, and therefore we get better estimates. And um, in the case f is equal to zero, it recovers the classical theory of Marcellini, and also the Orlid space setting theory is covered as well. For instance, uh, oh, there's a typo here that should be p. For instance, when uh, f, when we are in the p Laplacian setting, then the previous estimates uh, give back the, the optimal one in the setting of the p Laplacian. So the previous apparently weird estimate with this integral uh, then actually gives you the sharp one known for the pillar flash. So we also recover the previous results. Then we recover also the estimate of Marcellini. And then we can treat many other functions. For instance, we can consider a function as with arbitrarily exponential growth. So you can consider any composition of any exponential, and then you can get that uh, the gradient is bounded under the usual condition, which is universal. Um, when f is equal to zero, we can get uh, better estimates uh, that are original, uh, I mean, uh, or that are, that are um, natural in this setting. For instance, we can get this a priori bound that allows you to bound the gradient via the gradient passing from a log x cancellation result. So the previous estimate due to Marcellini 
was losing uh, a log and uh, this is clearly suboptimal because uh, here the meaning is that a log cancels an exponential and then you get du to the p and du to the p of course you can repeat this with any composition of any exponential and getting log 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 x x x and whatever in fact this is a a, 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 a special case of this general theorem that tells you that whenever you're minimizing a functional and this is a general all its function and n function as those considered when you get um, Lorentz spaces uh, and uh, sorry a lot early spaces then you can uh, pointwise uh, okay you can globally bound the infinity norm by this quantity which involves this uh, cancellation between a to and a this is a classical result under the delta 2 condition it was not known without the delta 2 condition delta 2 condition means that if you make a variation inside the integral then you can still control by a constant by a universal constant by the integral itself this is clearly not the case with the exponential this is clearly not the case with the exponential and therefore this had remained an open, the validity of this estimate had remained an open problem for many years in this setting now we can treat it because uh, in this in this setting we are we are in a, in a way dealing with these problems as they were uniformly elliptic and therefore we can fully get uh, all the estimates you get in the uniformly elliptic setting too okay and um, just let me finish this um, uh, this talk uh, with a uh, cheap trick a cheap trick is uh, is an oversimplification of some viewpoints developed uh, with Lisa, and this is done in a recent paper by Cristiana de Filippis and myself. And it's a cheap trick that uh, shows you how in a particular situation you can fully reduce the theory of non-uniformly elliptic operators to the theory of uniformly elliptic ones, actually in a straightforward way. So I'm going to consider these kinds of usual growth conditions. P and Q growth conditions. And uh, therefore, the lowest eigenvalue is bounded from uh, below by du to the P minus 2, and from above by Q minus 2. And then you additionally have a growth condition with respect to the X variable. This is known to be the sharp bound, the sharp bound under which you get a priori estimates under which you can have these a priori estimates. Moreover, when you combine this bound and this estimate with a suitable approximation condition that still requires the absence of the so-called overrated phenomenon, this a priori estimates turns to be a real estimate for real minimizers. I'm not going to talk about this because this is an introductory talk, but let me show you how to get this a priori estimate under this sharp bound only using the uniformly elliptic theory. So only using the case when P is equal to Q. You can surprisingly do this in three or four lines. Okay. The first thing you know, you want to know, is the precise dependence on the constants in this setting. You can always assume that mu is equal to 1 by scaling, and then, uh, and then when p is equal to q, if you trace the dependence of the constants in the classical proof, then you get this estimate. And here it is crucial that c is a universal constant, so it depends on nothing. L is this constant, and this is the estimate that you, you come up with if you trace the dependence on the constants. So the, the point I would like to mention here is that in regularity proofs, the dependence, the, the explicit dependence of the constants on the constants uh, is usually overlooked because it's not really relevant. You say the constant depends on this, this, and that, then you don't care what it is. Here we care what it is. Th this is actually the hidden point in the proof. You, you just trace what is the constant dependent 
the constant dependence in the usual proof. So you go to the usual proof and you wonder, okay, what is the explicit constant? Okay, what is the best constant that you can come up with by the computations? And that this is what you come up with. The magic fact is that it is going to work. Okay, now this is as long as P is equal to Q. And these growth conditions are considered in particular this growth condition that bounds the second derivatives by Q minus P. Now, you make the following very stupid observation. Before you get Q minus P, then since Z is going to be the gradient, you plug out the L infinity norm of the gradient, and then you rewrite the previous condition, the previous Q growth condition as a P growth condition by, with a new constant. This is a new constant. So in a sense, now the problem has P growth conditions. The problem has P growth conditions. And uh, this is what it is. Therefore, you have this standard growth condition. And uh, now you have a P problem with a new constant, and then you apply the previous estimate. The previous estimate gives you this. This is what you're doing. You're using the P estimate with an explicit constant to have this estimate. Now you look at this exponent, which is Q minus P times N over P, and you observe that assuming the sharp bound, which is known for PQ problems, gives you that this new exponent is strictly less than one. So therefore, this exponent, Q minus P times an N minus P is less than one, and you can apply Young's inequality to get this on different balls, on different balls. Okay, but now, you recall this um, very classical lemma by Jacquint and Juicy that tells you that uh, if Z is a function with this growth properties and epsilon is less than one, then you can reabsorb this as T1 would be equals to T2 after iteration. Tau one, tau two, then you can reabsorb, you see if tau one would be to, equal to tau two, then you can we absorb this, and then you get one over my, uh, one over one minus epsilon here. But this is not the case because they are not equal. But nevertheless, after iteration, you can do it. So you iterate this estimate, and you can reabsorb. So we are exactly in the same uh, condition because uh, this is the function z. This is the function z, and epsilon is equal to one half. So you iterate, and then you get your a priori estimate. So this a priori estimate is just a consequence is just a consequence of the p estimate plus this simple observation of course the magic fact is that in order to get this proof you want to go into the classical p proof where the dependence on the constants is usually is usually overlooked then you recover the dependence on the constants and then this specific dependence on the constants gives you, I mean, the key to the a priori estimate in the PQ case. And this is the best estimate you can get because when P is equal to Q, it is not surprising that you get the usual and infinity L, the P estimate, which is uh, classical for P harmonic functions and also for harmonic functions. And I think that this is uh, my last slide. And so I thank you for the attention. This is uh, Paul.